Today's talk is about English accents, which means ways of pronouncing English. English is a language spoken by very large numbers of people, and so there is a wide variety of possible ways of pronouncing it. And so for this morning's lecture, we're concentrating on varieties other than received pronunciation. And uh, on the handout, you can see that I've organized this by, first of all, looking at various characteristics of regional accents of England. I haven't really time to look at Britain as a whole. And then considering some of American characteristics, and lastly, Australian, given that these are the areas I assume you're most urgently interested in. Now, one of the interesting things we notice in England is that the split between the north and the south, which people are aware of, generally corresponds to the fact that northern accents are more conservative than southern ones. And there are various historical sound changes which received pronunciation has undergone, but which didn't take place in the north of England. And this is an example. As the spelling sort of suggests, words like sing used to end in a vela plosive, thus sing. And this pronunciation still persists in parts of the north of England. Well, really from the Midlands northwest but including, importantly, the large cities of Birmingham, Manchester, and Liverpool. And there people say thing, hang, long, long, and so on, with a final g. Not only, therefore, is it sing, but it's singing, and the person who does it is a singer. This provides us with a useful check if we compare the person who sings with your digit, your finger on your hand. Because in Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, these words run. Singer, finger. She's a singer. This is my finger. Whereas, of course, in all other varieties of English, they don't run. In my own speech, I say, this is my finger, she's a singer. Americans would say finger, singer. Again, they don't rhyme. So this is a retention, if you like, of a historical feature that was lost elsewhere four centuries ago. It's very interesting that it can persist for such a long time, and it's very low profile. People are not really very aware of this. It's not stigmatized or regarded as terribly wrong or anything. Similar considerations apply to the next sound change we consider. In Middle English, words such as put and words such as cut have the same vowel. And indeed, again, the spelling suggests this to you. In the north of England, they still have the same vowel in popular speech. Now, what this vowel is can vary a bit. There are northerners who say put and cut. There are other northerners who say put and cut. But the point is it's the same sound. Whereas in the south and in all varieties of English outside England, put and cut don't rhyme. We have a contrast. Another minimal pair there. Well, not minimal pair. Rhyming pair. Full and dull. In the north of England, in popular speech, these rhyme, full and dull. <coughs> so again, this is a kind of conservatism. This is a very characteristic feature of Northern speech. If you go by public transport in Leeds, you go on the bus. The bus. Whereas in London, it's a bus. It's very nice in the north of England. People will often address you as love. That is love. But with a northern pronunciation, love. Hello, love. <coughs> love. 
Now, this has a, a consequence of a more theoretical, more abstract nature if we consider the short vowel systems in English. You remember we looked at this, we were calling it, it was the leftmost part system when we considered all the English vowels. And in received pronunciation, as in a typical South of England pronunciation, there are six short vowels, as in kit, dress, trap, lot, strut, and foot. But in the North of England, because the vowels of strut and foot are not distinguished, strut, foot, you've got only five short vowels in the system. Kit, dress, trap, lot, foot. I mean, there are certain phonetic differences as well, but what I'm emphasizing here is the system in the linguistic sense of the vowels that are contrasted with one another. This also means that there are one or two words where southerners, non-northerners more generally, can discuss how we pronounce them. What is the name of the place that the priest gives a sermon from in a church? Is it the pulpit or the pulpit? Some people say one, some people say the other. I say pulpit. But this whole debate is meaningless in a northern accent because there's no choice. It's got to be pulpit. There's no contrast between the two possibilities. Okay, so a systemic difference between north and south. Now, northerners who move south or who are upwardly mobile, socially speaking, into the areas where people don't expect a strong local accent, have a problem sorting out these two vowels. Because the spelling doesn't tell you. The spelling is usually the letter U, sometimes double O, but that doesn't help. Consider the problem in a phrase like, good luck. Now, if, you're, if you've grown up with a northern local accent, you say, good luck, or it might be good luck. But it's the same vowel in each one. To posh up your speech, you have to think now, is it going to be good luck? <laughs> or is it going to be good luck? Well, actually, it's going to be good luck, but it's very difficult to, to remember this. You have to split one of your phonemes. And so a very good way of recognizing, shall we say, upwardly mobile northerners is by one or two particularly tricky words. Sugar is one of them. You tend to hear people saying sugar <laughs> instead. Cushion is another, where you get cushion. Well, after all, a cushion becomes percussion, drums and so on, so you would expect a cushion to behave likewise. It's very, very difficult. It's always very difficult to split one of your own native phonemes into two. It's the same problem as interference in foreign language learning. The same reason that Japanese have problems disentangling R and L, the same reason that Spaniards have problems disentangling B and V, the same reason for all the first ship and sheep. All of these things where we have to split one of our native phonemes, it's very hard. Okay, the third important indicator of a northern accent in England concerns words in the lexical set above. There are a sample of words like this. These historically had a short vowel. So it was bath. Likewise, pass, glass, grass, staff, raft, laugh, laugh, puff, after, castle. And in the north of England, they retain a short vowel, the same vowel as in tramp, or the animal, the cat. So in all those Northerners would say to pass, uh, to drink from a glass, keep off the grass. Now, you'll be familiar with this really from American English, because Americans retain the vowel of cat and trap in these words, although it's undergone other changes in American English, giving us the pass, glass kind of pronunciation, not exactly short anymore. But the point is, it hasn't moved into the same vowel as father. In the south of England, and also in received pronunciation, these words moved into the same set as father, the vowel of start, and so on. So we say pass, 
glass, grass, staff, raft, laugh, bath, path, after, castle. Do you notice the environment in which this sound change took place? It took place before voiceless fricatives. Before, well, F is the frontest one, isn't it? Staff, raft, laugh. Then the dental voiceless fricative, bath, path, and so on. And then the alveolar voiceless fricative, pass, glass, pass. You would sort of predict, therefore, that it, it would affect words like dash or cash, <coughs> which have a voiceless fricative. But for reasons nobody really understands, this sound change failed before sh, mm -hmm. before the palatal <coughs> So we still have a shorthand in dash and cash and mash and stash and so on. Furthermore, there were various words which seemed to meet the structural description with one of the other three voices fricatives, but which, for reasons we don't understand, didn't get caught up in the sound change. So, mathematics is shortened to maths, not maths. Americans call it math without the S, that's irrelevant. Although we say pass, we don't say mass, most of us. A few Catholics say it for the religious service, but in the physical sense, everybody says mass. Short vowel. Although we say castle, we say tassel. And that mentioned dash. And so this gives us certain <coughs> contrasts, non-rhyming pairs, which you can use to test them. In received pronunciation in the south of England, bath and maths don't rhyme, castle and tassel don't rhyme, Pass gas do rhyme. In the north of England, they do rhyme. Math, math, maths, castle, tassel, pass, gas. And of course, in American English, they also rhyme bath, maths, castle, tassel, pass, gas. So these are lexical inconsistencies, as it says on your handout. There are some little maps from uh, Collins and Macy's book. Uh, the top one on the right there shows the area that has long R in Bath words, Bath broadening. And you can see it's basically the southeast of England. The southwest is a bit indeterminate because they had other lengthenings of vowels, which means the contrast doesn't necessarily work in the southwest. But it's very clear in the southeast. North, on the other hand, keeps the short vowel. And you notice that the line goes from the inlet known as the Wash, north of Norfolk, down to the estuary of the River Severn. So it's known as the Severn Wash Line. It more or less coincides with the line in the lower map, which distinguishes the shaded area that says strut and the unshaded area that has strut and so on. So the unshaded area that has put and cut with different vowels. There's a sort of um, uh, non-overlapping area in Herefordshire or somewhere, but basically those are both northern versus southern features. <coughs> Back to the bath words. This is not a matter of a difference in the system. Northerners have short and long a ah, because they have minimal pairs like ham and harm or cat and cart. So it's not a matter of not having a long vowel, it's of not using it in the bath words. And this means that in a typical southern accent, you have one, one vowel in tramp and hundreds of other words like it, and a different vowel in bath and start and hundreds of words like them. Whereas in a typical northern accent, you have one vowel in trap, and lots of words like that, and the same vowel in bath, and those words, and a different vowel in start, which is long. The quality difference may not be very great in the north, but there's certainly a difference of duration. So that a cat is an animal, and a cart is a vehicle. A very contrast. Now, another historical change. Those of you who know about the history of English will have heard of the great vowel shift. Well, this took words, for example, like face, which comes from French, in which it 
have the pronunciation fas. Came into Middle English as fas, but ah changed to a. Eh. So fas became face. That's one of the important parts of the great vowel shift 600 years ago. That leaves us a long monophon, a face, face. But nowadays we use a diphthong, a, 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 a. So this is one of the important changes in most kinds of English that the a monophon became diphthongal, face. It joined in, therefore, with what was already a diphthong, a historical diphthong in words like den. We nowadays have the same vowel in face and den. But this change wasn't carried through everywhere. So in parts of the north of England, in other parts remote from London, so sort of Devon, Norfolk, certainly in Wales, certainly in Scotland, certainly in Ireland, you still get monophones. And people say face or face rather than face. Same with the back vowel, the animal a goat came out of a great vowel shift with a, a long monophon, or goat, goat, which then became diphthongal goat, goat, that's the RP of 100 years ago. We've now changed the diphthong, so instead of O, it's now O, and we say goat. But again, in the north of England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, you can get this goat pronunciation, goat. My brother's name is Tony. <coughs> we grew up in Lancashire. <coughs> In local Lancashire pronunciation, his name is Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Tony. <laughs> there are a few places where the diphthongs and monophthongs didn't fall together. And where you therefore have a contrast between eight with a diphthong and late with a monophthong. Or between tore on your foot and toe to pull along. Bits of South Wales, bits of Northern England, bits of Norfolk have that kind of contrast. However, let's move on now to a very important change in the history of English, and that's R dropping. I think looking at the history is a helpful way to understand why different pronunciations are now different. Uh, if you think of a word like farmer, well, the spelling tells you, and history tells us, that it used to be pronounced by all speakers of English with two R sounds in it. So, farmer. Farmer. As of course it still is in American English, farmer. And in Scottish English, farmer. And in Irish English, farmer. But in most English speech, we had a sound change that involved the loss of R before a consonant, like the M in farmer, and at the end of a word, again it's in farmer. So this word exemplifies the two crucial positions where this change happened. So nowadays, we don't say farmer, we say farmer, farmer. And again, it's a matter of conservative pronunciation to retain the R. Accents that retain the R we call rhotic, R-H-O-T-I-C, and um, Scottish English, Irish English, most American English. They're all rhotic accents, and they retain these historical R's. If you look at the handout, you can see that there are certain pairs of words which fall together as a consequence of this sound change. <laughs> the bird, long legs, nests on rooftops in Central Europe, is supposed to bring babies, a stork. And another word for stem of a flower or something is stalk. They are identical for me. They're homophones, stalk, stalk. But before the loss of R, they were distinct because one was stork and one was stalk. They've fallen together. <laughs> Likewise, ma meaning to damage and ma meaning mother were distinct. Now they're the same. Every now and again, people get confused, therefore, about the spelling. We have to learn which stalk to spell which way. We have two words, source. One you would put on your food, the other is the origin of something. We have to learn which word to spell which way, and sometimes people get, get them wrong. 
Americans, Irish, Scottish people don't get these wrong because they just think of their pronunciation mm -hmm. and that tells them how to spell it. Uh, this also affected the er uh vowel, the vowel in nurse, which used to be R colored, nurse, long schwa if you like. Well, we lost the R coloration in here, giving us the er uh pronunciation we now use, nurse. And again, you will find in the west of England, in Scotland, in Ireland, people still pronounce an R, so you have west of England, nurse, Scottish nurse. Likewise, the ends of words such as letter used to have an R, still does in American English, letter with their R colored schwa. Again, this has consequences for us when we try and change our accent. You get a lot of British actors, English actors, I should say, who want to play American parts or want to pretend they're Scottish or Irish and whatnot. And this means you have to restore these R's. You think that because we're literate and know how to spell words, this would be easy. All we have to do is think of the spelling and follow it. In practice, this proves not to be the case. English actors get this wrong, right, left and centre. <coughs> so if we have the word China, for example, people think it ought to be China. If we have the word sofa, they feel it ought to be sofa. And this is what actors do unless they really discipline themselves. Banana, is it banana or banana? Not sure, but they're not going to come out with banana unless they're very careful about it. So again, it's this problem of splitting what is the same in your own accent. It's very difficult, whether it's within the same language or when learning a foreign language. Another historical change. Again, the spelling tells us that words spelled with WH used to have a pronunciation with a voiceless onset. So it used to be why when, which, somewhere, somewhere. Nowadays we say why, when, which, somewhere. This is a fairly recent change, something like 200 years old, and it's been resisted in Scotland, where on the whole everybody still says quote, and largely in Ireland. The Americans are following our path, but a century later, so the Americans are now gradually losing the H, but there are still quite a few Americans who have it. Again, this means various pairs of words fall together. <coughs> People used to distinguish wine to complain and wine to drink. Nowadays we say wine identically for both of them. There's a kind of feeling around in Britain, though, and England, that the quote pronunciation is more elegant. Even though we don't do it sort of natively, sometimes people feel it would be very beautiful if they did do it. And so, I don't know, you know people speaking in public, especially carefully, uh, I've unkindly said primary school teachers as a typical example. We could also take actors, of course, and people declaiming poetry and so on, Shakespeare. Try and do this, but we get it wrong! We had a very well-known newsreader who Creased, or, creased us all up, all the phoneticians abused us very much, because she reported uh, a crime which was a break-in at a warehouse. <laughs> a warehouse, that of course should be a warehouse. But I'm the correction again. So, those who don't do it natively have problems with story. Okay, so far then, these have all been sound changes over the last, what, 500 years that have been resisted in various parts of Britain. Let's move on now to consider what happened in American English differently from what has happened on this side of the Atlantic. Oh, sorry, before we do that, I just want that screen to show you this is about worse still. Uh, I had a questionnaire where I asked people which pronunciation do you prefer, white or white, for the colour? And this tabulates the responses by age. You can see that people born up to 1933 were equally split. Those born between 1934 and 1953, which includes me, of course, had a sort of two-thirds, three-quarters majority for white. 
those born since 54 to 73, something like nearly 90% for white, and the youngest age group, it approached 100%, despite the fact that this includes the Scottish respondents. So that shows there's a very clear association with age for what people say they prefer. This is not the same as what they actually do. We know from other evidence that what people actually do is say white in something like 95% of the cases, just the few Scots and so on being an exception. But this is a difference in evaluation, in perception of what's going on. And this is what leads me to say that this has taken about 200 years to work through because we know that it started, people first started commenting on work from work about 200 years ago. There is a map for the same thing in North America. The blue dots are where the both reports people having the vowels, uh, sorry, having the consonants distinct, quote and what. The yellow ones are uncertain, and the black dots are no distinction. And although the blue dots are bigger, you will see that the black dots outnumber them very much. So America is clearly going down the same route. Okay, developments before R. The loss of R wasn't a straightforward matter because before the R was lost, various sound changes took place before the R, in position before the R. Which means that when we take a word like beer, which historically was beer, E plus er at the end, beer, R dropping did not lead to the pronunciation B. Nobody drinks B. <coughs> so we know that before the R was lost, there was a change in quality from E to some kind of ear, from beer to beer. Scots, by the way, do still today say beer with long E plus er. But Americans don't. What do Americans say? Beer. Beer. Uh, it's a bit of an ear, rather like ours in some ways. On the other hand, it seems not to be in contrast in American English with the simple ear of kit. So Americans tend to regard it, GA, General American, as just short e. Beer. Beer. Likewise, beard, as we say it, was beard. Americans now say beard. Beard, really like bid plus an R, beard. What happened with us in England, of course, is that we lost the R in beer, but we retained it if the next word begins with a vowel, beer and wine. And that's our linking R. So that's the kind of historical remnant, that linking R. One of the most noticeable differences between a general American pronunciation and received pronunciation is the quality of the vowel in words like lot. Where we have rounding, back rounded vowel, or, 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 or. Americans more typically have an unrounded, not quite so back vowel, lot, lot. So where we have a bottle of scotch, Americans have a bottle of scotch. Or indeed a battle of scotch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the quality of the vowel varies quite a lot, but generally speaking, it's unrounded. And not only is it unrounded, but there is a loss of distinctive length. When we take the word bother and compare it with father, we have different vowels in those two, and they differ not only in quality, but also in length. Bother has a short vowel, father has a long vowel, there's therefore a different rhythm. Bother, father. In American English, they run in perfectly. Bother, father. Don't bother me. He's my father. Okay? And this means that the American R vowel sounds a bit like a long vowel to us. It's not scotch. It's scotch. It's not a bottle. It's a bottle, usually. And it's extra length. 
And this is why people transcribing American English often don't use length marks at all. I do in my pronunciation diction where I give both British and American because it's easier to keep the same transcription for both varieties. But for American English on its own, really, there's no need to use length marks. Okay, here's another very famous American innovation. T-voicing. In certain positions, American T comes to sound like D. So there we have a picture of an atom, as I would say it. And this is the first man, Adam and Eve. Many Americans would say these two words identically. So that's an Adam. And this is Adam. Both of them are Adam. Adam from Atomic and Adam from Adam and Eve. What seems to have happened is that in American English, both T and D, between vowels, <coughs> various intervocalic positions, underwent a kind of acceleration, a speeding up. Before we come back to T, let's consider a D sound in a word like ready. Are you ready? Now, different varieties of English have subtle differences of duration here. If I do a caricature Welsh accent, I'd say, are you ready? Are you ready? 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 Very long D. Like Japanese people saying bendo. Ready. <laughs> My English is ready. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? American English is, are you ready? Are you ready? Ready? It's faster. Ready. It's almost a tap, like a Spanish R. Ready. Now, this happens to both T and D. And it's very difficult to switch voicing off and on again, which is what you have to do in atom, if the actual duration of the segment in question is so very short. It's really difficult to say atom. Switching voicing off, making your tap, switching it on again. So they take the easy path, and you keep the voicing going. Adam. I think that's the origin of this in American English. I could be wrong. Anyhow, it has consequences of large numbers of words that fall together. And Americans, as a consequence, get problems with spelling. They don't know how to spell ready. Is it R-E-T-T-Y? American school children, we know, do that kind of thing. I saw a long discussion about kiddie porn on the internet. That is child pornography, but instead of spelling it kiddy from kid, K I D D Y, it was spelt K I T T Y, as if it was about cats. <laughs> Very confused. But of course, kitty and kiddy in American English are going to be identical as kitty. If you ask Americans about this, they sometimes insist that they don't make these words the same, they insist that they do make a distinction. Well, the fact of the spelling mistakes is good evidence that, that they don't. But also, uh, over 50 years ago, over 60 years ago, there was an experiment carried out by an American phonetician where he had ambiguous sentences. They were like this. Uh, the wounded lamb lay bleeding by the fence. Now, did the lamb bleat or did it bleed? Both make sense. Uh, the uh, candidates for baptism waded in the river. Ah, <laughs> did they wait or did they wade? Anyhow, he got Americans to say these without telling them what the investigation was about and played them back to listeners. Of course, the listeners had to say which meaning they had. And the results, well, they weren't entirely random, but they certainly were nothing like 100% recognition. Mm -hmm. And that's 60 years ago, so that's two generations ago. Now it's clear that the confusion is much greater and people don't normally don't distinguish them. Every now and again, there are Americans who claim to make a difference of the preceding vowel. So a writer and a rider, instead of being identical as a rider and a rider, some Americans claim to say a writer and a rider where a writer is one who writes books, 
And a rider is one who rides horses. Well, there are Americans who do that, but not most. And if you take your average Californian, certainly rider, rider, they're both the same. You don't know which is which. Uh, yeah, there's what I said about it in Longman Pronunciation Dictionary. Uh, the thing is that uh, not only does it make shudder and shudder the same, it also applies after N for some Americans. So you get voicing of the T in a word like winter, careful Northeastern American winter. With T voicing or tapping, that becomes winter, winter, winter. And the T in turn then easily gets omitted and you end up with winter, winter. As I say, though, some Americans consider this pronunciation incorrect. What's perhaps more important for us is to notice that this very often applies to the T at the end of a word. So, although we say right in American English, as we do in British English, in American you can say, you say right away, right away, voicing it before the vowel of away, right away. But not, of course, in right now, where <coughs> the following sound is a consonant. People, you know, sometimes say, well, now, why don't you show this in the dictionary? Why don't you just write these words with a D in the dictionary in the phonetic transcription of American English? And this is the reason why not. Because word finally, you have to look at the next word. And we would have to have a double entry for all the very large numbers of words that end in T after a sonorant. It's the same problem with dark L, clear and dark L. Why don't we put this in the pronouncing dictionary? Because for every word that ends in L, you've got to have clear L if the next word begins with a vowel, dark L if it doesn't. And so it's better for the learner to know the rule, to learn the rule, to operate the rule, and to be able to apply the rule. If we take T in this crucial position at the end of a word, there are various things happening to it in contemporary English. Not only, but also. Not only this, but also that. Well, classically, historically, it's a voiceless alveolar plosive. Not only this, but also that. But in different kinds of English, we are trying to get away from a voiceless alveolar plosive. Some people are trying to get away from it being voiceless. Some people are trying to get away from it being alveolar. Some people are trying to get away from it being a plosive. So, if we look first of all at the place of articulation, the alveolar, in London, it becomes a glottal stop. So instead of making it with the tongue tip, you make it in the glottis, in the throat. Not only, but also. Not only, but also. You retain the voicelessness, you retain the plosive quality, but you lose the place of articulation. In American English, you keep the place of articulation alveolar, you keep the plosive quality, but you lose the voicelessness, giving continuous, continuous voicing between the vowels, not only, but also. This is, by the way, not unknown in British English. It's not really very well documented, but if you listen to our peace speakers, you could quite often hear this. Not only, not only, not only, but also, not only this, but also that. And indeed, British rather than British. On the other hand, mostly we have a voiceless T, not only, but also British. And Americans notice this as a very characteristic British pronunciation which they may mock. Now, that's place and voicing. What about the manner of articulation, plosive? Well, there are two ways of getting away from this. One is associated with the north of England, where you tend to get a change. This is the bottom one, actually. This is where you tend to get a change to R. So in a broad northern accent, 
you could say not only this, but also that. This is where people say get off for get off and sure up for shut up. This is the local accent to where I come from. And uh, it's considered very rough, very vulgar and so on, but you can hear it all over the place. In trying to understand how this happened, I think we have to go through the voicing one. If we start with not only, but also, and then have the American style acceleration into a tap, not only, but also, that sounds to English ears like a kind of R, and therefore it gets equated with other kinds of R, and because in a lot of the north of England, People use an ordinary English R as in red and so on. That's what they use here too. It's say go off and sure up and not only. A somewhat different change is associated with Ireland, with Southern Ireland. An Irish pronunciation of this phrase would be not only this, but also that. Not only, not only, not only, not only. Can you hear it? Not only, not only, not only. <laughs> Failure to make a complete closure. So we get a kind of fricative. It's not quite an S. It's not not only. His is different from his. I think this is because the tongue is still flat. So it's still an alveolar fricative, but not a grooved alveolar fricative. S is grooved. Air channeled down a narrow groove. This Irish thing, it's just a flat fricative, flat tongue fricative. And so it's not quite like an S. Uh, I'll just show it here with the diacritic that indicates opener articulation. So the complete closure is missed. Not only, but also. T tapping, but yod dropping. That's the other thing that we associate particularly with American English. We've already seen news in London speech. Americans overwhelmingly say news rather than news. You do get both of them. But you also get it after T and D, so Americans typically say tune, where we say tune, or increasingly tune. I don't think anybody in America says tune. That's only a British pronunciation. There's a map. Oh, no, this is a map for something else. This is a map for the next thing going on. Uh, this is a map for changes in open vowels. <coughs> in American English, classically, traditionally, they do have a difference between the vowel of thought, thought, and the vowel of lot, lat, thought, lot, thought, lot. But increasingly, Americans don't make the difference, but they say thought and lot if they come from the Boston area, or fat and lat if they come from California. In other words, they don't have this contrast anymore. And so we've got on the handout the minimal pair caught and cot, both pronounced cart by many Americans. This then is a map for that in American English. Blue is those who make the contrast, green is those who don't. And you can see the green ones are becoming the majority, particularly west of the Mississippi. This is very generally the case. Canadians don't make the difference. When I came to do longer pronunciation dictionary, and I was thinking of the needs of people who learn American English, you know, Filipinos, Taiwanese, and so on, I said, well, now, why, why do we bother with this, since there are millions, probably hundreds of millions, of people who don't make this distinction, native speakers of English, why impose it on Filipinos who find it difficult? So I propose not giving it, but just saying that all these words are pronounced with R, fart, and so on. They tested it out. I must hand this to Longman. They do market research. They find out what people would say. And the reaction from the teachers was, no, 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 you can't do that. We must teach this contrast. Mm -hmm. So ever responsive to market demands, I'm afraid I gave it as the first choice to make the distinction. But I did insist on giving a second choice for American English, which is not making the distinction. Uh, that's more of the same from above. We've just got no minutes left at all to have a quick look at Australian English. Australian is basically like British English. 
but phonetically, in phonetic detail, it has quite a few differences. So the system is the same. You can transcribe it using the same symbols in the same words, but you have to interpret the symbols a bit differently. One place where this is not the case concerns weak vowels. You remember I mentioned this before. If we take the pair of words offices and officers, for me they're different because the plural of office has e, offices. The plural of officer, of course, has a, officers. But there are already quite a lot of British people who don't make any difference, and certainly the Australians don't. So they say officers, officers, both the same. You don't know which is which. Tended, tended, both the same. Founded, founded, you don't know whether it's founded or founder. So, general boycott of it as a weak vowel in Australian English. The Australians have definitely taken on board the American T-voicing. This is an easy way to hear apart how Australians are different from Londoners. Sometimes people say Australian sounds like Cockney. Cockneys can say better for better. Australians really don't. They say better, better. And what you spread on your bread is butter. Butter from Australia farm. That's the advertisement <coughs> habit. Butter. Uh, another very characteristic giveaway for American English is the front quality of the long R vowel. When we say car park in London, in RP, Australians say car park, car park, ah, 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 front quality. Same in New Zealand. Start, barbecue. You throw a prawn on the barbie. From a prawn onto the barbecue issue. <laughs> but the diphthong shift in words like face is as in London, so Australians say good day to greet you. And I think at that point, I too will greet you and thank you very much. Thank you.